We want to welcome everybody to this CAPR webinar. Just a couple of housekeeping items on our first slide. I'll talk a little bit more about Q&A momentarily, but just want to let everyone know that we will be uh, recording and archiving and making this webinar available, uh, including the slides, in a few days. So why don't we go ahead and transition to our opening slide. Uh, hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Nikki Edgecombe. I'm delighted to serve as moderator for today's webinar, where we'll be sharing some findings some for some very hot off the press reports from CAPR and hear from institutional and state partners um, pursuing evidence-based approaches to DevEd reform. A housekeeping note, as I mentioned, we encourage you to use the Q&A function if you have any questions about the research or the presentations from our practitioner and uh, state partners. We'll do our best to answer those questions in real time or near, near real time. And we also welcome you to use and share reflections via the chat. We'll also be putting some resources in the chat so everyone has access as well. Next slide, please. Before we begin formally, I wanna thank the Institute of Education Sciences at the US Department of Education for their core funding for this work. We're also grateful to Ascendium Education Group and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for their generous support of CAPR research. Next slide, please. So just to walk through our agenda, today I'll kick things off with a short introduction of CAPR. Um, and then pass the virtual mic to my CCRC and CAPR colleague, Beth Kopko, who will discuss findings from our study on multiple measures assessment. After Beth, we're excited to have Sharon Fox from Arkansas, who would talk about the institutional perspective on reforming assessment and placement. After Sharon, S Susan Sapanek from MDRC and CAPR, We'll share findings from our study of the Dana Center Math Pathways Evaluation. And Nancy Shapiro from the University System of Maryland will conclude our formal presentations describing the important role research played in their multi-year, multifaceted DevEd reform efforts. We'll end with some Q&A. Next slide, please. So please advance, Hannah, thank you. So for those who are just learning about the Center for the Analysis of Post-Secondary Readiness, or CAPR, we began in 2014 as an IES-funded R&D center co-led by the Community College Research Center and MDRC. The first phase of our work centered on three main research activities. The national study surveyed institutions and interviewed practitioners and policymakers to learn more about their DevEd reform efforts. The two rigorous evaluations of which you'll hear more today tested an alternative assessment and placement system and one of the earliest math pathways models developed by the Dana Center at UT Austin. If you could advance, Hannah. We've had many milestones, meetings, reports, presentations over the years. I highlight just a few here on this timeline. After five years of research and engagement with the field, we hosted a conference in 2019 where findings from our first phase of research were presented. Importantly, we took time to hear from attendees about the work they were doing, as well as the next set of reform priorities. In doing so, we heard a lot about the need to reduce disparities in academic outcomes by race and income. In other words, lots of questions about equity. If you could advance, Hannah. CAPR entered 2020 with a lot of energy and excitement. Both IES and Ascendium had committed to supporting additional research. I recall the enthusiasm among attendees at the Strong Start to Finish Learning uh, Network convening in March 20, early March 2020, a sharp contrast to the worry and concern we were all experiencing by the end of the month as we navigated the very early days of the pandemic. At CAPR, we worried that much of the DevEd reform momentum would stop given the closures and disruptions caused by COVID. On the contrary, we didn't see commitments wavering. Instead, we saw innovation spurred by circumstance. For example, many colleges abandoned traditional assessments and used other means to place students. 
and the sky did not fall. <laughs> we also saw the transition to online learning, elevate conversations about teaching and learning, and what it means to create an engaging and inclusive learning environment. If you could advance, Hannah. So like you, the Capper team kept moving forward, conducting research and working closely with states and institutions to translate findings into policy and practice change. In 2022, we pushed out a lot of resources and uh, resources, resources and research, excuse me, which you'll find on our website. We published a synthesis of DevEd reform research conducted since 2010. We boiled down our takeaways from the research into five principles for reform. We also developed a multiple measures assessment toolkit that provides policymakers and practitioners with tangible guidance and tools on developing, implementing, uh, and evaluating a multiple measures assessment system. Next slide, please. I'll leave you to read the principles and dig into the synthesis elsewhere, but I do want to say a few words about the implications of what research of what the research is telling us. First, we are waging the battle to support students' academic and non-academic needs at the college level, not in prerequisite sequences. This raises interesting questions about the role of assessment and placement though. Perhaps that system is really about understanding the very particular needs that students have in thinking about creating and deploying the resources those students need as they begin their major coursework. Second, DevEd reforms will need to work together with other reforms to materially improve completion rates. What have we learned about policies and programs that propel students' academic momentum, help them stay enrolled, and increase their enrollment intensity? Three critical components of, of attainment. Next slide, please. And lastly, what has to change to get us to that vision of education equity mentioned earlier? I'd suggest that our DevEd reform efforts today are reflected on the whole in the figure on the left. Here we see before and after results for generic intervention. In this illustrative example, students in group A, group B, and group C all benefit from this reform, seeing a 20 percentage point improvement in this outcome. But group C's outcomes lag a lot, particularly when compared to group A. What we aspire to is something more like what we see in the figure on the right. Here, students in all groups continue to see improvement in a given outcome. But what's different is that the change from before to after is bigger for group C, 32 percentage points, helping to reduce the difference we saw in the previous figure between groups A and C. We don't yet definitively know what changes to make to developmental education reform or what initiatives we can implement in conjunction with reforms to get us closer to the figure on the right. But we have some promising theories and research to build on, including creating more inclusive learning environments, integrating culturally sustaining classroom practices, and embedding more robust non-academic supports into courses, uh, into academic courses. At Capper, we hope this next third phase of reform and research gets us closer to this vision. With that, I welcome my colleague Beth to present the work of her team on multiple measures. Thanks, Nikki. Um, so hello, everyone. As was mentioned, my name is Elizabeth Kopko. I'm a senior research associate at the Community College Research Center. And today I'll be discussing some of the findings that came out of the long-term follow-up study of CAPR's evaluation of multiple measures assessment. Next slide. As one of CAPR's three original studies, this project kicked off at a time when research was accumulating to suggest that the standardized tests used by most institutions were likely doing a poor job at measuring college readiness and placing students. In turn, many began advocating for and or experimenting with alternative approaches such as multiple measures assessment or MMA to arrive at a more holistic picture of students' academic preparation by relying on a broader set of measures such as high school GPA and course taking. While these alternative placement systems seem promising, few had been rigorously evaluated, motivating the CAPR study. Next slide. So in order to get the project underway, we partnered with seven community colleges in the State University System of New York to do the following. First, we worked with colleges to develop college-specific 
uh, subject specific MMA algorithms, which utilized a combination of test scores and high school transcript information in order to predict the probability that a student would pass a college level course with a C or better. We then worked with faculty to set cut scores, denoting the minimum probability of success a student would need to demonstrate via the algorithm in order to gain access to that college level course. Next, we implemented an RCT, randomized control trial, wherein students who took a placement test between fall 2016 and fall 2017 were randomly assigned to be placed by either the existing test-based placement system or by the new MMA algorithms. And finally, we tracked the academic outcomes of all participants for at least nine terms and looked for differences in outcomes based on the placement method, method to which they were assigned. Next slide. Before moving on to our results, it's important to understand how MMA actually impacts students' placements within the study design. So keep in mind that colleges collected placement test scores as well as relevant high school transcript information for every incoming student. In turn, for every student, it was possible to tell what their placement would be according to the test scores and what their placement would be according to the MMA algorithm score. Comparing these two placements reveals that for some students, their placement was going to be the same no matter how they were placed, while for others, their placement level depended on which measures were considered. For example, and as demonstrated in the top row of this slide, some students had test scores represented by the left side of the person icon that were above the threshold for college level placement and also had MMA algorithm scores represented by the right side of the person icon that were above the threshold for college level placement. In other words, the left and right hand sides of the person icon match for these students. For other students, however, their eligibility for college level courses varied depending on which measures were being considered. For example, some students had test scores that were above the threshold for college level placement, but had algorithm scores that required them to enroll in dev ed courses. For these students, the left and right side of the person icon do not match. What the Capper experiment did was to randomize which measures or set of measures would be used to determine placements for each student. For students who are randomly placed into business as usual group, colleges look at their test scores or the left side of the person icon to make placement determinations. For students who were placed in the program group, colleges looked at their MMA algorithm scores or the right side of the person icon to make placement determinations. As you can see in the bottom row of this slide, what this means is that MMA only impacted some students' placements. Fully teal and fully blue students were always placed into the same course level no matter what while students represented by the bicolored icons were placed into different courses, depending on which study group they were assigned to. Next slide. And since we're interested in understanding how MMA impacted student outcomes, for the next few slides, we are gonna focus our attention on the subset of students whose placements differed depending on which study group they were randomly assigned to. In other words, the group of students whose test scores and MMA scores indicated different levels of college readiness. Next slide. For our purposes, we categorize these students into two groups. First, there is the bump up zone. These students had AccuPlacer scores that fell below the cutoff for placement into college level courses, but also had algorithm scores that exceeded the threshold for placement into college level courses. This is the group of students whose placements get bumped up by the MMA algorithm relative to the status quo. And we also have the bump down zone which includes those students whose AccuPlacer scores exceeded the threshold for placement into college level courses, but also had algorithm scores that fell below the cutoff for college level placement. This is the group of students whose placements were bumped down by MMA. Next slide. So now let's turn to some results. Generally speaking, we found that bumped up students had substantially better outcomes while bumped down students had substantially worse outcomes. Here we present college level course completion rates among students in each of the bump zones by subject area. Let's look first at the top two graphs representing the bump up zone. As you can see, program students represented by the TIA line who were bumped up were more likely to complete a college level course in each of the time periods considered. By the ninth term, bumped up students in both math and English were about nine percentage points more likely to complete a college level math or English course with a C or higher. The bottom two graphs on this slide show the same outcomes for the bump down zone. If MMA 
provided more accurate placements, we would expect students who were bumped down to benefit more from developmental coursework, performing even better than their peers who were placed into college level coursework without the opportunity for the support provided by developmental education. However, this was not the case. In fact, in almost all instances, bumped down students fared worse than their peers who were given the opportunity to directly enroll in college level courses. Here, for example, we see that bumping students down decreased their probability of completing college level math by about five percentage points and completing college level English by about six. Next slide, please. This same set of graphs shows that bumping up students in math was about as effective as bumping up students in English and bumping down students had similarly negative effects in both subjects. Again, there was about a nine percentage point advantage in college level course completion for bumped up students and about a five to six percentage point disadvantage for bumped down students. These similar findings across math and English may serve to mitigate concerns that MMA cut scores need to be tailored by subject area. That is that using MMA to increase access to college level coursework can help promote better student outcomes regardless of the specific subjects being considered. In our study, we also considered a range of non-subject specific outcomes, including some longer term outcomes such as persistence and credential attainment and transfer. While we do not find any evidence that MMA improved rates of persistence, we do find evidence that MMA improved credential completion or transfer among program students in the English bump up zone. By the ninth term, students who were bumped up in English were two percentage points more likely than their business as usual peers to earn any credential or transfer to a four year institution. Next slide. Although we were unable to conduct subgroup analyses for the bump zone samples due to small sample sizes, we did conduct subgroup analyses by subject or student characteristics of interest for the full analytic sample. Generally speaking, we found that MMA improved outcomes among several individual subgroups. Unfortunately, however, despite these outcome gains experienced by the subgroups, we did not find any evidence that existing outcome gaps between subgroups narrowed due to MMA. Next slide. Overall, the results from this study strongly support the use of MMA over traditional test-based systems. Moreover, this research also illuminates some important lessons that we can carry with us as we continue this work. First, we should be working towards using MMA to increase access to college level courses by giving students the highest placement possible. We find that the positive impacts of MMA are generally experienced by the subset of students whose placements are bumped up, while those whose placements are bumped down fare worse. Therefore, we are strongly recommending using MMA to bump up students into a higher level course than they may have otherwise been placed to under the status quo. Bump zone findings also reveal that access to college level courses matters more than accuracy of placement for improving success in both college level math and college level English. To this end, we re recommend that colleges avoid focusing too much time developing complicated algorithms or focusing on subject specific differences and instead move towards adopting a form of MMA that is relatively easy to implement and communicate. We also strongly advise against using MMA to further restrict access to college level courses. Finally, with regards to equity, it is important to recognize that MMA alone is not sufficient to remediate longstanding disparities that occur in higher education. To drive more equitable outcomes, we must move beyond universal reforms and focus our attention on adopting policies and practices that are explicitly responsive to the barriers encountered by underserved student populations. Within the MMA context, this might include selecting inclusive placement measures, such as self-reported high school GPA, or implementing MMA alongside post-placement support programs that are tailored to meet the needs of specific populations as they navigate college. So with that, I thank you for your time, and I will now turn it over to Sharon Fox from Northwest Arkansas Community College, who will share some of her institution's experiences with adopting MMA. Sharon. Good afternoon. I, as I said, I'm Sharon Fox. I'm the Dean for Communication and Arts here at Northwest Arkansas. Prior to this position, I was actually the chair for the English department, and I have been involved with developmental education since I started here about five years ago. 
Um, in that time, we have you know, had all kinds of uh, things that we've been working on and we've had COVID, which we will talk about. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? So Northwest Arkansas Community College, which we just call NWAC, um, is the largest community college here in Arkansas. At this time, we have 8,409 students, uh, which is the largest number that we've had since 2019. We've had higher numbers, but as I said, COVID came in and sort of changed for most of us our numbers. Um, we are an open enrollment institution, so uh, that means that multiple measures is very important to consider because we really do have students coming in at every level and um, coming in that are barely literate to, you know, our honor students and uh, are having, um, you know, a much easier time in classes than others. I included here our economic impact because NWAC is uh, having quite a large uh, role in what's going on in Northwest Arkansas, which is growing at this point, um, the area, NWAC is specifically in Bentonville, Arkansas. We are averaging 35 people a day are moving to this part of the country, um, which means, you know, uh, NWAC has the opportunity to make a lot of changes here. Next slide, please. Uh, we are one of the uh, data colleges here in Arkansas for CAPR's uh, study that they're doing. As you can see, uh, we've got South Arkansas University, University of Arkansas Cossetot, um, ASU Mid-South, South Arkansas Magnolia, and ASU Jonesboro. So, you know, we've got a good mix. We're all over the state. Next slide, please. Thought I would just go through what we do offer here at NWAC. Again, because we have such a range of abilities uh, for both English and math, it is required for us to have many options for them. We, of course, have Composition 1, which is your college-ready student who's come in, who um, you know, has scored whichever one we're using well enough to go straight into it. But then we have a few other options. We have Composition 1 plus Lab, which is basically, so you've got your three-hour Comp 1 plus a one-hour Lab. It's mostly grammar, a little reading and it sort of helps those students who specifically are sitting right around the bubble of being college ready, gives them that little bit of support. Until fall of 2021, we had our composition one with a reading class and a separate writing class. All of that came to a nine hour block, which was quite a lot of time for students to um, put into for English, especially as when we'll talk later, they're usually also taking math. And um, so thanks to Strong Start to Finish, which we were also part of, um, we switched to our Composition One Plus a Studio, which is now a six hours, so three hours of comp plus a three hour reading and writing studio. This is time for them to work. It works about 60% reading, 40% writing support. But as we have students who are coming in at sort of a second grade level, uh, they really do need all of those um, helps. And then we have a comp one plus comp review. This is for our ELL students. We have, uh, we're sitting at, I think, 24% in Hispanic students. We also have a large Hmong um, and Marshallese communities that are around here. And so they will often have, if they're sort of newer or have been, you know, in classes in high school where they were separated, they need a little bit of help beyond just sort of how to read and write, but also with some of the language acquisition. Um, English department at NWAC at this time is completely correct. So all of our courses are taught at the same time. Um, math is working on that process right now. So they have a series of prereqs that are available. Again, if we have students who are coming in at a very low level, they have to do some prereq courses. Those are our foundation classes and beginning classes. We have the college ready algebra. Uh, but then we have a college algebra with intermediate algebra, college algebra with review, and these are sort of different levels, depending on where the student's coming in. And then we have quantitative reasoning, which has a million names from that I can tell across the country. But this is kind of your math for life class. And we have that with review as well. And if there's a program that will allow students not to take algebra, then we get them into QR, um, either on its own or with review. Next slide, please. Multiple measures for us started in fall of 2020, thanks to the pandemic, which is probably how a lot of people ended up in this place, um, because suddenly we couldn't do all the ACT testing. And so we had to come up with what are our other options. Um, prior to this, AccuPlace or ACT, SAT and a writing sample were kind of how we placed people in math and English. So obviously the writing sample is more English centric. 
Um, but with the sort of removal of testing, we had to look elsewhere. Next slide, please. Um, so this is kind of where we went to in that first implementation. This is June of 2020 to be put into effect for uh, the fall of 2020. And it was kind of any of these measures are going to get in. And they did do studies and figure out where our numbers need to go, but it was kind of had to be done a lot quicker than we are now in the process of doing. So we went through and figured out what are all the options, what are our GED, uh, sorry, I read GED, high school GPAs, where do we want to go to? And this was across the board um, for, for English classes, and I didn't find the one for math, so apologies. Um, next one, please. So after we'd done that and we got started participating with CAPR on, you know, how we would build a really solid multiple measures assessment program, uh, we were given suggestions. You know, we had to include people, obviously, from math and English, and we have a multiple. We have a committee that has multiples from those and from English for College and Career. That's our ELL program. Assessment had to come in because, you know, we have to make sure that what we're doing in all those classes when we're putting students in that they are still getting the experience that they're expecting. Financial aid because multiple measures, you know, putting people into developmental classes does affect people's financial aid. Not all of them allow for uh, the support classes. Enrollment services, first year successful, CAO, uh, VP for learning, we had lots of people. What we ended up figuring out, though, is there were a few other stakeholders that we felt we needed to add. And it's a little harder to see. They're in green. Um, veteran services became an important um, ally with us there. All of these people come. There's about 20 of us when we all show up that come to a meeting once a month as we work through our process of properly um, moving to a multiple measures uh, program that is as equitable as possible, as um, Beth mentioned. With veterans, we have quite a few of our veterans that come in who are scoring lower and may have been a while since they had high school. And we have so we needed to bring in veteran services to make sure that those students were being equitably placed. Our Disability Resource Center um, has been a really good addition to our uh, to our committee because we a lot of the students who are coming in who need to be placed into a developmental class are also dealing with obstacles that are um, based on sort of either physical, emotional, or intellectual um, issues that they're also bringing into the conversation. And so it's been a really big help to have our DRC uh, coordinator come in and talk with us and make sure that everything we're doing also meets that need. And then a big one for us was adult education. We do have a thriving adult education program here that um, is free for students and is there specifically for those people who are kind of coming in, might've been a few years since they were out of school, and adult education becomes an option for those students who are very low that we can get them in to get some extra help before they come to class. This is a way to also help save some money for them because if we can get them through adult education, then they can retest. And the hope is that then they will be placed higher and you know, hopefully into a college ready class. Uh, next slide, please. So our first semester of implementation, we were trying to keep track obviously of how we were doing for uh, with that placement, what it was doing to their GPAs. And as you can see here, uh, with our the three to three five, we're doing better. Um, and then three five plus, we're doing even better still. And so what we had to do, because originally we were at 2.85 and at this particular semester, uh, the numbers went, were, you know, down. And so we had to look at what we needed to do. What do we need to do with our numbers to make sure that the number of students going through our programs are successful, preferably the first time. Next slide, please. So where are we at? Uh, at this point, this is kind of where math and English are working on. So for high school GPA for math, that's where we're starting. The threshold does vary depending on what class that they're going into. Um, the next level is to look at their high school course taking, specifically pre-cal and statistics, and make sure that they passed that. So we've got sort of two layers. And then we look at the ACT, SET, and ACU placer again, always with the point of getting our students into, 
you know, to, to get through as quickly as possible and preferably into a college ready class. For English right now, we're sitting in a high school GPA of 3.0. And uh, we're looking there first. If they score that, they go into a college ready. And then our ACT, SAT, Accuplacer is still there. It's actually required by our state to be one of our measures um, and one of the first measures. Can we go to the next one, please? So this is, what has that done to our numbers? And I did kind of pull as a little random here, and there's gonna be a lot more involved in this than just multiple measures. But I went to 2018, which was, Right before the pandemic, what we were looking at for number or, you know, a couple of years before and then what we're looking at for this past fall. What has it done to our numbers? And again, there are going to be other factors in here, but I think it's really interesting that in fall of 2018, ENGA is what we call our developmental program. Um, is we put 642 students in there by fall of 2023. You can see that we have almost halved. The same is true for our developmental math in that um, time. And then it's always interesting to me the number of students who are required you know, to take both math and English. Um, this was one of the reasons why we did go to the six hour instead of the nine hour block for English is because our students were taking this nine hours of English and then six hours often of math and that was their 15 hours were done and this allows them at least to take something else that is college ready that is encouraging to them. As uh, so you can see hope that our numbers did change and our percentages we really did get close to half so it has moved a lot more students into a college ready class than had previously been done. Next slide. Getting close. Obstacles we're facing right now. We are um, going through a bit of an advisor turnover. I found this to be true in a lot of places, so uh, this is not going to be news to many people. The problem with an advisor turnover is that you're constantly reteaching how to do multiple measures, and that it it is a learning process for advisors, especially if they are looking, you know, seeing multiples of students all day long, and it is a little more time consuming to do a proper multiple measures because you are trying to get them into a college ready class and that's not always the first option. Sometimes you have to dig down a few and you can kind of see what the holistic view is of that student rather than one placement. We're looking at um, equity. It's a big thing for us making sure that our students who came in with IEPs from high school and our ELL students are getting placed correctly. This is um, has been kind of a both for both math and English is something that we have to consider because math is so much more reading intensive and writing intensive than we might, you know, initially think. And so making sure that students have not been either set aside in classes that um, caused them to be, you know, to have maybe a slightly inflated GPA. So it, it requires us to keep digging down, look for extra information. And that's something we're working on and that's causing a bit of an obstacle for us. Um, one of our is previous college classes, and we're having to figure out, like, how do we determine which class counts as them ready? Because honestly, if you've done, gotten an A in basket weaving, that doesn't necessarily mean you're ready for a math class or an English class. Um, and then uh, one of our big obstacles and one that we're still figuring out is that first week. The first week of a semester, as much as time as we can put into placement um, we're still going to miss a few people or there'll be people who are, you know, once we get them in the class, get them writing, we realize either way that they're struggling with language and we need to get them into the, the sections that are more ELL based. Um, or we have to, you know, see if, you know, we, we've got some big changes to make. So we're trying to figure out how we do that. And again, this is why we're taking our time. We have February, we have to have you know, a good idea of what we're doing and it needs to go in the catalog. So that's kind of where we're at. Uh, I think that's my last slide. So now, um, oh yes, I did have what's next. Final decisions. By February, we have to make our final decisions. Um, and so this is what we're working. By fall of 2024, we plan to be done with our uh, decisions and it will be put into the catalog. That is definitely my last slide, thank you. Uh, we're now gonna move to Susan Sapanik, who's gonna be talking about supporting underprepared students in the math pathways. Thanks, Sharon. Hi everyone, I'm Susan Sapanik. And I'm a researcher at MDRC, and I'm going to share some findings from a long-term follow-up study of the Dana Center Math Pathways. 
Next slide. As many of you know, historically, students entering community college, not ready for college level math, were, and in many cases still are, often required to take a developmental math course sequence of one to three or more non-credit bearing classes before they can take a college level math course. By the early 2000s, a majority of community college students were taking one or more developmental math course, with students of color and students from lower income backgrounds more likely than their white and higher income peers to take these courses. Yet the majority of students taking these courses were never completing their developmental math sequence nor any college level math courses. And research has found that students who take traditional developmental courses do not tend to do better and sometimes do worse than similar students who are not required to take developmental education. Given these problems, reformers, including the Charles A. Dana Center, at the University of Texas at Austin began to rethink how to support students with developmental math needs. The Dana Center Math Pathways, or what I'll refer to as DCMP during this presentation, um, was first implemented in 2011. It included four major reforms to traditional developmental math. First, it created different math pathways depending on students' plan degree a statistics pathway for students in social sciences, social services, or health professions, a quantitative reasoning pathway for those majoring in liberal arts, fine arts, or humanities, and a calculus pathway for those in STEM fields. Second, it accelerated the developmental math sequence by requiring all students to take only one semester of developmental math, regardless of their math needs whereas traditional developmental math sequences could require two to three semester courses, depending on the level a student tested at. I would note that while this study looks at DCMP with this one semester developmental course requirement, more recently, the Dana Center has been promoting a co-requisite format where students enter directly into college level math with additional supports offered at the same time, but that came a little bit later and is not a part of this study. Third, the model revamped math courses to follow an evidence-based curriculum and pedagogy, working to make the course more engaging to students by focusing on authentic tasks that reflect real life situations and emphasizing a student-centered format in which classroom activities are designed to encourage students to read, write and speak about their math learning. Finally, it included additional supports for students integrated into the course and or aligned with the course like tutoring and regular check-ins. Next slide. The study is an individual level randomized control trial conducted at four Texas colleges. The implementation for the study began in 2015. The initial study found positive impacts on students' completion of developmental and college-level math courses during the first three semesters after students began participating. These positive findings led to this long-term follow-up, which looks at findings after five years. The outcome measures include math completion, which was measured as successful completion of students' first college-level math course, academic progress, which was measured as total college credits earned after five years, and academic attainment, which includes any credential attainment or transfer and current enrollment at a four-year college. The hypothesis here was that DCMP would lead to more students completing developmental math and more students passing college level math which would in turn lead to more students persisting in college and ultimately attaining a credential. Next slide. As I noted earlier, early positive findings on math completion led this, to this long-term follow-up study. After five years, it was still the case that more DCMP students had successfully completed their first college level math course than those assigned to the traditional developmental math course sequence. 
I would further note that in subgroup analyses, we found that students most positively affected by the program were students who tested two or more levels below college ready. And in fact, the program had a negative effect on those students who were better prepared, those who tested one level below or who tested at college ready. DCMP was originally envisioned for the students testing further below, and those students were the students that most, it was most supportive of. We also found female students were more positively impacted than male students. There were no clear differences found between students of different races and ethnic groups, but a majority of the students in the study were Hispanic. We did not find a statistically significant impact of DCMP on college credit learning, nor on completion of a credential, including completion of a certificate, an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree, or transfer and continued enrollment at a four-year college. Students assigned to DCMP did similar on these outcomes to their counterparts not assigned to DCMP. In conclusion, I would note that while the impacts on math completion did not lead as hypothesized to broader impacts on college persistence and degree attainment, this is a similar finding to other developmental education reform studies. And it may be that while a program like this early version of DCMP supports math completion, which can be an important barrier to college success, many students may still need additional and possibly longer term and more consistent supports to persist in college and attain a degree. There is one study coming out of the City University of New York that finds a math pathways model implemented with a co-requisite format where students enter directly into college level math with concurrent supports um, is effective in moving more students, not only to math completion, but also to degree completion. As I noted earlier, the Dana Center has more recently moved to promoting a prerequisite format for DCMP, rather than including the one developmental course that we have um, in the implementation for this study. The findings of the CUNY study suggest this might be a move in the right direction for the Dana Center and for for other um, programs doing this work. But more research is needed to better understand the effectiveness of the combination of math pathways with co-requisite courses. And that concludes my presentation. And I will now pass the baton on to Nancy Shapiro from the University System of Maryland, who will talk about their work with math pathways and co-requisites. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. So I'm Nancy Shapiro. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor at the University System of Maryland. And what I wanna to talk to you about today is how all of this research that you've been hearing about informs state policy. So my, my talk is about the role of research in state policy reform efforts. And the big questions, the two big questions that were, were being asked in our state were, what is the policy problem we're trying to solve? And, and why was USM chosen to do this work? So what, what, next slide, yes. The slide looks like it's a little stuck. There we go, thank you. So what was the problem we were trying to solve in Maryland? Um, the problem is that too many students were taking developmental math. And as Susan mentioned, um, that's a barrier. That's a barrier to progress through college. That's also a huge cost to the student and to the state. You can see from these two data points, community colleges, in community colleges, 71% of the students placed into developmental math, and that goes into the placement question, which I'm not going to talk about this minute. Um, and about a quarter, about 25%, 24% of the four-year college students enrolled in developmental math. And the cost per student per year for community college students was about $7,000. And for four-year students, um, it was about $9,000 per student per year. So you can see this at the state level, we're trying to solve this problem. Uh, next, next slide. So why did this land in my office? 
office. The university system, um, I don't have any faculty in my office. I don't have any students in my office. We do have 12 public universities in the state, in, in the state, in Maryland. Um, and USM is really one of the most diverse public systems in the country. We serve, give or take, around 170,000 students across the state, which in a small state is a big percentage of the population. And our institutions are quite, as I said, quite diverse. We have four research universities, R1s. We have um, half a dozen um, uh, what used to be state colleges, comprehensive universities. We have three historically Black uh, institutions. We have large universities, uh, 30,000 students at the University of Maryland, 2,000 students at small at a small college, Coppin State University. We have regional institutions, Western Maryland, uh, the, the Eastern Shore, and urban institutions. So we really cover the waterfront. So that's one reason that USM got involved in this. Second reason is that the work of my office is to be a convener. Um, my office has a, a subtitle of the, we're the P20 office, the preschool through graduate school office. So we look at pipeline. We look at students coming into our universities. Are they prepared? And students leaving, um, do they, can they get good jobs? As a convener, I don't just convene the USM institutions, but I reach across the segments to work with the um, community colleges in the state, which don't have a system, but they do have an association. There are 16 community colleges and I work closely with them on a lot of topics. And um, we at the university system, because we have this as a P20 policy office, we sort of have like an I wouldn't call it an inside track to federal grant money, but we give the feds a lot of bang for the buck when we when we propose a project. So so here we have a state issue, and we were asked at, in at the university system what we could do and how we could learn from this. Next slide, please. So the first thing that happens whenever I do a, a big multi-institution cross-segmental project is you really have to, so we lead by influence, not authority, all right? I don't have any say over what the colleges do. They have, they have presidents, they have faculty. I'm, like I said, a convener. Um, I also have even less say about what the community colleges do. But what we can do is lead by influence. So we put together a planning team and develop some common goals, some shared goals. And the first goal was to reduce time that students were spending in developmental and remedial math courses. Um, we also wanted to increase the percentage of first year students who successfully completed those development, developmental math courses and then moved on to a general education math course and completed that. Um, we wanted, we, we looked across the, the country at the possible opportunity. You know, we're, we're build, we didn't want to create anything. We wanted to use what was out there that was really, we knew had research evidence-based success and pull it into Maryland. Um, and so we decided to, uh, you know, after you just heard the Dana Center, um, the wonderful research that had been done on and the evaluation of the Dana Center pathways. So we decided to pull in the, the Dana Center pathways, um, which would place students in more appropriate courses for their to sort of fit their educational goals and their degree program areas. And the pathways, for those of you who aren't familiar, in addition to the traditional algebra pathway, um, a statistics pathway, for example, or a, um, a general um, a topics and mathematical literacy pathway. Um, the other thing that was really important to us as in terms of shared goals across the project was we really needed to invest in advising. And Susan mentioned um, the changes in, in some of the challenges that um, happen when advisors change. Well, if we wanna put students or advise students to go into pathways that are more relevant to their major, we better get some good advising practices in place. So those were sort of shared goals. Next slide, please. Um, I pulled it, so I invited all the USM institutions and all the community colleges to join this project. 
And we ended up with five USM institutions that had high developmental enrollments and seven community colleges that were ready to step up and do the work. So I had 12 institutions. Again, not the whole ball of wax, but a good significant um, number of, of institutions of diverse um, uh, interests. And we created the Maryland Mathematics Reform Initiative um, pro program logic model. The first thing we had to do was create the new developmental courses and pilot them. Uh, and we had faculty, math faculty who did this work. We drew on the Dana Center experiences and the knowledge base that they had. We then had to recruit students to enroll in these new courses. And we set up a quasi-experimental model. So we had students, We uh, Westat was our evaluator and they helped us tremendously. Um, uh, Nikki Edgecombe was on our um, uh, advisory board. Uh, Capra was very uh, helpful in helping us understand how we put together this logic model and this quasi-experimental study. So we ended up with two, two um, an experimental model and a traditional model for courses one being a statistics pathway and one being the traditional algebra pathway. And we collected data on our, uh, within our 12 institutions over two cohorts, one beginning in summer, fall 2017, and one in summer and winter, spring 2018. And then we also reached out to the National Student Clearinghouse to track transfer students who were coming from the two-year colleges to the four-year universities. So that's sort of the logic model. Next slide. So what happened? Well, as you've heard in some of the other presentations, there really is a difference. Um, if you give students different options, instead of just funneling them all into a traditional, you know, intermediate algebra course, we, gave, we uh, used our quasi-experimental model and we had a, a treatment group, which was the statistics um, pathway course, and the comparison group, the traditional students went into an intermediate algebra course. And were there differences in the treatment and comparison students? Yes, we had a statistically significant larger portion of the students in the treatment, the statistics pathway, um, then passed the developmental math course more efficiently, more effectively than the students in that traditional comparison student group. So that was a 77% um, uh, of the students in the treatment um, in the statistics pathway passed compared to 69%. Next slide. We also had, you know, the question, again, same question that uh, Susan asked earlier, did they take the, the, not just the developmental course, but were they successful in their first credit bearing course? And the answer was, they were just as successful as the students who completed the traditional course. So were there differences between the treatment and comparison students and the rate in which they passed the credit bearing math? No, once they enrolled in credit bearing math course, there were no significant differences in passing rates. So they were equal. So next slide. Um, but what we were able to do is reduce the number of attempts that students made to try to pass that developmental class. So they didn't get churned through one, two, three different developmental courses. The, the students in the, in the experimental course that were only took the course once, and then they went on to their college credit math course. So what we find here is that among students passing developmental math, were there differences between the treatment and comparison students in the number of unique attempts they made before passing or the number of semesters elapsed before passing? And the answer is yes, the treatment students, the ones in the pathways made significantly fewer attempts to pass and passed in fewer semesters than the comparison students. And you can see the comparisons there. Next slide. Working on the next slide, I see, oh, there we go, okay. And the other, remember the other question wasn't just um, whether or not students could get through the math courses more effectively, but it was gonna reduce costs for students. And sure enough, the, the students in the treatment um, sections with, was, was a 36% more cost effective 
and helping students enroll in credit-bearing math compared to the comparison group, which makes sense because if you only have to take the pathway course once, instead of repeating developmental courses multiple times, you're gonna save money and save time. And we um, effectively measure that at about a 36% cost effectiveness for our students. Um, next slide. And so in summary, um, when we're talking about drawing on current research to inform policy, what did we find? We found that the statistics-based developmental math approaches can be cost-effective and helped underrepresented students pass the math that's required by many majors. I didn't give you slides on the, the differential between our underrepresented students, but I didn't have time to put all those slides in, but we know which students end up in the developmental courses. And so, and we did an analysis of, of the disparity. And sure enough, this pathway was, was a, better, a better fit. Um, the second finding was that the subgroup results showed similar outcomes for both part-time and older students. So even the students who leave, like the veterans that, that Susan mentioned, even the students that leave and then come back, if we put them through the pathways model, they were more successful quicker. And finally, um, this is such a promising approach for reducing costs and improving access to post-secondary education that it not only opens up opportunities, but it actually, we were able, when we published this and when we, we um, disseminated it around the state, um, now all the community colleges and all the four-year universities have pathway alternatives to the traditional um, college algebra pathway uh, for math. So that's the story of how we draw on the model, the research that's out there to inform policy and affect good policy recommendations. And I'm gonna now turn this back to Nikki for whatever time there's left. Thank you, Nancy, and thanks to everybody. And thank you to everyone who put questions in the chat and the Q&A. Um, our folks have been busily trying to be responsive to your questions. A couple big themes that came out of that. One is related to, seems like a lot of attendees in their institutions are wrestling with um, questions around the predictive validity of high school GPA. We'll make sure that when we send um, our link with the recording and the transcript and the slides for this um, webinar that we include what information we can on that particular topic as it is a, a pressing topic that is, I think gained more salience post pandemic. The other thing that we've seen in a lot of the questions are around supports for particular populations, be they English learners, students coming from the adult education um, uh, pipeline and uh, neurodiverse um, students who, who may have um, some kind of difference disability. And while much of our research did not necessarily examine the particulars of those largely due to some challenges we have around classification, um, you know, Nancy and, and Sharon have had to, to, to work with institutions to think about that. So we'll think about ways we might be able to share a few stories that are responsive to the questions that you have. So um, we will again follow up um, by email for everyone registered for the webinar with links to the recording and to the slides. And we thank you so much for your time and for joining us today.